Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives podcast, a podcast dedicated to your health and well-being, featuring interviews with experts about nutrition, physical and mental health, and my five-minute food facts series, which are short episodes where I discuss nutrition-related topics. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host. I'm a lawyer turned nutritionist, and I'm on a quest to learn as much as I possibly can about living a healthy, active, and fulfilling life, which I would call a vibrant life, and sharing what I learn with you here on this podcast. The health and nutrition space can be a confusing one where information and misinformation mingle, and untangling fact from fiction and identifying reliable, trustworthy sources of information is not always straightforward. My aim is to help you do that by speaking with knowledgeable guests who can explain their area of expertise in an accessible way and provide you with practical tips that you can use to improve your own well-being. Before I introduce today's guest, I'll quickly acknowledge that any information or advice provided in Vibrant Lives podcast is not intended to be used to treat or prevent any medical conditions, and it's never a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today, my guest is Jerry Doyle, who is a civil engineer and the CEO of Tonkin Consulting. But don't worry, we're not here to talk about engineering. We're here to talk about mental health. And as part of that, Jerry will be sharing his own story of living with chronic depression. As you may recall, I recently, in episode 92, interviewed Nathan Bolton about men's mental health, including his own struggles in dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and depression following two tours of Afghanistan with the Australian Special Forces. Mental health is something that is dear to my heart, and I know that a podcast can't cure any mental health problems, but what it can do is help break down the stigma around discussing mental health. And that's really what I hope Jerry and I are able to bring to you today. Mental health is a significant issue in Australia. It's estimated that 45% of people will experience a mental health condition in their lifetime. And in any one year, around a million Australian adults have depression and over 2 million have anxiety. I really admire people like Jerry and like Nathan who are willing to be vulnerable about their own struggles with mental health in the hope that it may help someone else. Before I begin my discussion with Jerry, please note that our talk will include references to suicide. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for coming on Vibrant Lives Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. So, Jerry, I'd like to start with some quick fire questions to know to get to know a little bit about you outside your work as a civil engineer and CEO of Tonkin Consulting. So, Jerry, where did you grow up? Um, I was born in Hong Kong. Oh, right. Lived in Hong Kong, Ireland, England, Australia and Singapore during my childhood. Um, I consider I probably grew up in Singapore. Mm -hmm. I was there between the ages of about seven and 12 and... Um, it was the longest stop in my childhood to that point. And afterwards, we came from there to Australia. But Singapore is the place that I kind of feel like I started to find mm -hmm. out about who I am. Right. That's so interesting. That's, that's probably the most interesting answer I've had to that question so far. <laughs> um, and your favorite form of exercise? I, I love running. Yep. I'm a mad runner. What kind of running? Uh, I do track work. Mm -hmm. um, so back when I was younger and fitter, I would race competitively over 200, 400 and 800 wow. metres. And I still train with people who do competitively, but I can't run the times I used to and I just I don't show up to the races anymore. Yeah, so. you just do it more for fitness and enjoyment? Yeah, I do. I, I occasionally get tempted to go and race. And at the moment, I'm thinking I might go and race next summer. But probably by the time we get there, I'll think better of it and go, <laughs> I'm not going to run anywhere near what I want to and I'll just end up mad. That's so. the problem with, with sprinting, I think, with longer distance. 
I don't know. You let go of that a bit more, particularly on the trails. Uh, I know people who have successfully let go of it. I just haven't found the way to yeah. yet. <laughs> so. uh, and your your go-to meal for dinner? Uh, is probably steak and potatoes. Mm-hmm. Now that sounds like a, a more of an Australian than a Singaporean type of meal. <laughs> uh, I am highly allergic to seafood. I have celiac oh. disease. I oh, have okay. all sorts of eating dilemmas. I actually love to cook. And while that is my go-to meal, it's probably the most boring thing that I cook. But I much prefer to cook than to go out yeah, just because you know then what you're getting. Yeah, yes. of course. Yes. And what are you enjoying listening to at the moment? I'm more of a reader than a listener. Yep. Um, I, I will listen to music, but I don't really mm-hmm. have strong tastes in it. Um, I enjoy reading, but I don't get to do as much of it as I would like. Yeah. Um, so what are you reading? Um, I'm reading Quiet by Susan Cain for oh, the third time. I love that book. And I'm reading um, Give and Take by Adam Grant for okay. the first time. Excellent. Which is common. I will read a book multiple times, but I'll usually have an old book and a new book on the go at the same time because oh, it will really depend on the mood. Yes, yes. I have several books on the go for that reason. I think quiet I, – I think it's rare to say that a book can change your life, but that book for me really did. Yeah. It was eye-opening for me. How did it do that? Because when I answered the questions about in the beginning, I was 100% an introvert. And I think we live in this world where being an extrovert is rewarded and when you don't fit that mould, you tend to think there's something wrong with you. Um, So, yeah. I I read the book and feel that it's describing me. Yes. But I've always kind of felt that way. I, I, I think I learned that I was an introvert very young. Um. And while I agree with you that it means that you don't fit the mould, you don't fit the way they want to teach you at school, they don't, you don't fit all of those things, I have always been more comfortable with being different than I have with being normal. No, that's, that's really good. I think the thing for me about it was that um, I'm not necessarily shy and I think in – Uh, the popular imagination, being an introvert means being shy, but it actually isn't about that. It's about where you get your energy. And I very much need time alone. Um, You're a runner. Yes. Well, I don't know know too many runners that thrive off being with other people because you run away from everyone else. It's the whole idea. (laughs) Um, I'm diverging a bit, but I just have to ask this. So you're an introvert, but you have five sons. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It, it doesn't really follow, does it? <laughs> yeah, it must be hard to sometimes carve out that time that you might need. Um, I Look, I am incredibly blessed. I am married to a wonderful woman who kind of gets that I need that, that oh, I'm nicer good. with it. Yeah. Um, and we've built it into how we do our life so that there is time – for me to go and do that. Some of some of my kids are also introverts and so we've learned we ha- we learn together how we have to live. That's that's fantastic that you can <clears throat> recognize and do that. And I guess also the plus side of having five boys or five children is that they can entertain each other to an extent as well. Oh, I'm not oh, sure they no? entertain each other. They more <laughs> fight with each other. If fighting is entertainment, then yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, now, my final quick go-to question is um, your favourite or dream holiday destination? At home by myself. So without the kids. Without the kids. Probably Sorry, without, kids. Probably without my wife for a few days, then <laughs> Sorry, she can wife. come back. Um, yeah, the the dream is is not. Uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a little bit of alone time. Maybe Jen Peace. Can, Jen can mm. Jen can come back after a day or two. I'll, I'll be ready for her then. <laughs> but you know, it's so good to know yourself, and we will get more into that. So. You're a civil engineer, I believe, and this gives me a little chance to educate myself because I don't know much about all the different types of engineering. So 
What does a civil engineer do? Uh, what does a civil engineer do? Um, civil engineers are kind of the engineer that picks up all the things that everyone else don't do. Okay. So um, for me, yes, I'm a civil engineer, but I've spent most of my professional life working in the water industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and a civil engineer in the water industry is, pipelines, pump right. stations, dams, treatment plants, yep. those sorts of things. Okay. Um, at university, there was always the joke that the civil engineers made the targets for the mechanical engineers to blow up. <laughs> um, and civil engineers generally make things that don't move. So buildings, roads. Bridges. Bridges. Tunnels. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That stuff. Cool. And why did you decide on that? Uh, well, there's, there's a story in itself. Um, so my father is a civil engineer. I and, wondered that. And growing up mm, around the place, yeah. I was in Hong Kong. I was born in Hong Kong because he was working on the MTR. Right. Lived in Singapore because he was working on the MRT. Time in other places was all about projects that happened in different places. Um, I finished high school, had no idea what I wanted to do. None whatsoever. And what I really wanted to do was see if I could make money out of running, which I wasn't good enough to. And I probably deep down knew that. Um, But my dad and I kind of had this uh, tension about what I should do. Mm -hmm. And um, it ended up being that I had to study something. I chose podiatry. Um, for an introvert who has really good gross motor skills but pretty terrible fine motor skills, podiatry is up there with the worst professions you could choose. And I hated it and I sucked at it. Um, and after 18 months, uh, came out the other side of it and fell into engineering because I was good at maths and science right. and I needed to find something I was good at because yeah. I really wasn't at podiatry. That's so interesting. I think these days children have a lot more guidance about what their their aptitudes are and what they, you know, might be a good career fit for them. Yeah, I think you're right. But I also think having, so my eldest son is doing first year university and my second son is in year 12 this year. And they also have to be open to it. I don't Mm. think I was at the time. I think I... I, I wasn't in a great place in my life mm-hmm. at that point and I didn't uh, – uh, going going and pursuing athletics probably would have been the worst thing I could have ever done. So it turned out to be a good thing that I was forced to study, but I had no idea what I wanted to do mm. I and I wasn't open to the guidance and it's interesting. My right. eldest son is studying psychology this year at university. Oh, so is my daughter. First year. First year. Yeah. Mm. Uni of Adelaide. Yes. Yes. How funny. There you go. <laughs> um, so we'll have to ensure they get to know each yes. other. <laughs> um, my, my, he was open to finding out about what he wanted to do. My second son, who's in year 12 now, he has only just started to show the slightest bit of interest of what might happen at the end of this year. Right. Um, mm. My daughter was very open to having some guidance. Now, I want to ask you, I hope this isn't a silly question, but I'm trying to set the scene for what we're going to be talking about later. If someone were to describe you, how do you think they would see you, like in an objective way, like they may not know you're an introvert. If someone were to meet you, say, in a work context, what do you think they'd say? Uh, that, that's a question I struggle with. Um, so I'll, I'll answer it in the way I see. I, I try and portray myself okay. maybe. Mm-hmm. So there are three sides to me, and I describe myself as having three veneers and I let people see two of them. So they're Mm -hmm. like a triangle. I'm drawing a triangle with my fingers. Um, They're like a triangle. And so you can only, you can see one side or you can see on a corner and Mm -hmm. see bits of two sides, but you can't actually see all three of them. Spoken like a true engineer. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Completely. Um, One of them is the family 
guy mm-hmm. and the person. And if people know me through my family, they probably don't think I know how to talk because I usually just stand there and let Jen talk for me. And she's really good at talking for me. Um, I don't feel the need to say a lot. Even when my my boys all love soccer and we spend a lot of time on the weekend mm-hmm. at soccer, and I'll be polite, but I don't enter into long conversations. There's a group of the dads for the under 18s, which my second son plays in, that they all sit around together, and I usually stand well away from them. I don't want to participate in it, and I don't feel the need to. Um, so they probably feel that I'm quite aloof and um, distant and perhaps shy all of which are probably correct Mm. the second side of me is the people who know me through sport and again I'm not a massive talker at sport things but I I will pick and choose what I say and when and how to be involved and Again, that is mostly sport is my outlet. It's mm. the thing I do for me um, in amongst all of this. And so the ability to go out and have my time, mm. it's really it. if people do it with me, that's great. But if they don't, that's also great. And so, again, I'm quite quiet and shy in there. If you know me through work, you don't see that side. Well, that's interesting. Because... To be the leader of the business, I have to be much more visible. Mm-hmm. I have to be much more out in front. Um, and I'm sitting here in a suit with pointy shoes on. And if you saw me in either one of those other two settings, I'd have sneakers, maybe tracksuit pants and a T-shirt that had holes in it <laughs> on. And I feel comfortable in that. Right. What I have on is my armour to be able to come and be the professional, mm-hmm. to to be much more vocal, to talk, to go to people and introduce myself and try and make them feel welcome and all of those sorts of things that I can do. Yes, yes. But it's a massive effort. And uh, that, I imagine, having read quiet, would leave you drained. Yes. Like you can do it. I can do it. But it's exhausting. And I can do it for a period of time. And then I just need to retreat. Yeah. But if you're a leader in your business, you're the CEO, you need to lead, don't yeah. you? So, And you're obviously well aware of that and, and do do that. Mm. Mm. I think you also I, – I have my own style. I'm not I, – I know other leaders who are – able to do this far better and more easily than I can. Not necessarily. It's just different. They, they look like they're more comfortable mm. in it than I feel. Um, and they can keep going when I need to retreat. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. like at work functions in the evening, I have openly said to people, if the thing starts at six, I will give you two hours of really solid trying, working the room, talking to people, being out there. But I'm pretty sure by eight o'clock I will be slumped in the chair going, can I please leave now? Yeah. Um, And if it starts at seven, I can give you till nine. If it starts any later than seven, I'm still only giving you to nine because I'm done. Yeah. Well, that's a long day Hmm. after a full day in the office as well. So one of the topics that we're going to discuss today is mental health as I mentioned in the introduction. A few episodes ago, I interviewed Nathan Bolton about men's mental health, and we talked about his own struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder and and depression following two tours in Afghanistan with the Australian Special Forces. So I think it makes sense to people why, after an experience in a war zone, you could suffer from PTSD. But Equally, Nathan's experience was so far outside the regular civilian experience. And, Jerry, what I think will resonate about your story is that many people will be able to relate to your life. So you can have all the, in quotes, ingredients for a good life. You can have a happy family, a steady job, a nice home. But that doesn't necessarily protect anyone from being haunted by mental illness. So, Jerry, could you give us a history or paint a picture of your depression and when you became aware of it? 
Um, okay. So I was first diagnosed with depression when I was 16. Um, I went along and saw a GP at the behest of my mother, who mm-hmm. was very concerned about me. I didn't let my mum come with me. I didn't let the doctor talk to my mum about what he found, and I never talked to my mum about what he found. Um, He told me that I was suffering from depression and that I should consider medication and talking to someone. And I told him in um, very colourful language, as only a 16-year-old can, (laughs) where he could go. Oh, dear. (laughs) Um, I... So I I kind of became aware of it when someone tried to diagnose me with Mm -hmm. something that I wasn't ready to hear and didn't want to know about. I buried my head in the sand. I kept going and through all of it and through all the different bouts and ups and downs I've had, I seem to have always been able to continue to do my day job Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without it impacting it massively i know it has impacted it but externally it doesn't seem to be particularly aware to people it's what happens when i'm not on that is where it all falls apart yeah um so i after being diagnosed at 16 i had a whole lot of experiences that i'm sure we can talk about I probably didn't come to accept it until in my mid-30s. Oh, right. So that's a long time of knowing about it before you accepted it. So how did it manifest itself for you? Um, I mean, only share what you feel comfortable with, right. obviously. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Um, I So for me, one, I, I, I constantly feel that everyone is going to work out that there's no way anyone should let me do half the stuff I'm allowed to do if they knew who I really was and what I really was. So I kind of have this imposter syndrome thing going the whole time. Like most engineers, I'm a perfectionist. And so I'm acutely aware of everything that I get wrong. And I tend to beat myself up over Mm -hmm. what I get wrong. Um, I... I have what I call the voice that sits in my head and mm-hmm. it tells me all the things that are wrong about me and all the things that I'm not good at and all the, th- the reasons why the world would be a better place without me in it. And when I'm in an okay place, the voice is quite quiet mm-hmm. and I can ignore it. When I'm not in a great place, the voice is screaming and I can't hear anything else. Um, and really the voice is the thing that... that I notice the most it's how loud it gets inside my own head. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm acutely aware it actually is my own voice and it's me who's talking to me. Um, So it's got to the point where I have uh, attempted suicide um, because I've been convinced that the world would be a better place without Mm. me in it. Um, And really coming to the point that I accepted that depression was something that I had to live with. Yeah. It came because I was in that place and I needed to get to a place where I could be there for my wife and children into the future. Mm. I think having a very strong external motivator like that is vital, really. But with the voice, one thing I was thinking when you were telling us about that is it's either loud or it's when you're feeling okay, it's quieter. Are you able to analyse and separate and know that that's the voice there? Because that's hard. When I'm in a good place, yes. Mm. Yes, I can. Yeah. When I'm not, no. No. Yeah, that's the trouble, it's, isn't it? It is. And it's yeah. it's the thing of going, well, what what's the trigger? What is it that, that makes it so that I can do it or not do it? I, I don't know. Um, the voice is always there. Mm. It's never, it's never, 
in as long as I can remember not been there. Yeah. Even even as a child, I was always riddled with self-doubt, riddled with feelings of inadequacy, riddled with fear over putting myself into situations. And I I I still am. Mm. I I can overcome it and I can do it anyway sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah. You know, it's it's I think one of the really important things about having a discussion like this is that from the outside, you appear very successful. You're a CEO, you've got five kids, you obviously have a full and busy life, but still, you're still struggling and people may not understand that depression is something that can really happen to anyone and it's not one of the things where you can just talk yourself out of it. You can't just say, oh, come on, you know, look at your life, it's wonderful, get on with it. Um, I really understand because I, I've also struggled with chronic depression in my life and sometimes I feel so angry with myself because I think, you know, you have a great life. You have a wonderful family. You live in a nice house. You get to run and you love running. What could possibly be wrong? But it's not those external things. It's internal. It's internal. Mm. And it's it's one of those ones that <laughs> I, I remember the, the first the first person I ever really told that I had depression was my wife. And I told her before, after I'd asked her to marry me, but before we got married, because I felt that it was not fair on her if, if she, she didn't, didn't know. know. Yeah. But I also didn't really accept it because you do, you, you look at your life and you go, my life is so much better than millions of people mm. around the world that live in poverty or live in fear of their lives for some reason, I don't have any of that. Yeah. But mm. yet I can I can honestly believe that the world is a better place without me in it, yet I have this brilliant life. Yeah. Now, it's such a paradox. When you told your wife, was she shocked or did she sort of say, oh, oh yeah, she knew. She knew. See, that's that's really interesting, isn't it? So she was able to see beyond the facade, obviously, because you were very close. And she's really the only person who gets to see beyond the facade most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good that you um, have such a wonderfully close relationship with her. Um, how do you think your depression, apart from perhaps with your wife, affected your relationships with others? I keep everyone at arm's length. Mm. I, I I know a few years ago I was asked if I would write a blog for the Mental Health Commission here mm. in South Australia. And I decided for some really unknown reason, they decided they were going to post it just before Christmas. And I decided that, well, I'd share it with some of the people that I run with. And I don't know why I did that. I, I felt to. And um, so I did. And most of them were completely, my coach was not, but the rest of them were completely shocked that it had happened. My coach knew because I've, mm. I'd shared with her what mm. was going on, but most of them had no idea and would never have picked it because all they see is what you let them see. Yeah, that one side and, of the triangle. Yeah, and mm. because I I keep people at arm's length and I don't go and hang out with the other dads and I don't yeah, sit there. Yeah, they don't know. They don't know. Yeah. And maybe the, the the team my son played, my eldest son played for a couple of years ago, there was another dad who generally came and stood miles away from everyone else and we found ourselves standing next to each other <laughs> and we've become reasonable friends out of it. Um <laughs> But, yeah, it was the two of us. Everyone else is on the other side of the pitch and we're over here. Did you think sometimes looking at them, it just looks so easy for them? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. One of my friends told me that he liked scoring 
at the kids' football and cricket and things because that was a way you could actually legitimately remove yourself. I thought that was a clever... Yeah, I, I'm a very proficient linesman for soccer. <laughs> yeah. But my eldest two kids play at a stage where they get pro- paid linesmen, so they don't need oh, a parent anymore. Oh, so you're anymore. redundant. I'm redundant. <laughs> so you, you were diagnosed when you were 16. You buried your head in the sand. But at what point did you decide that you needed some help or wanted some help? <sighs> um, to answer that, I need to tell you a little bit more of the story. So after being diagnosed at 16, I buried my head in the sand pretty effectively until the second year I was studying podiatry at university. So the first year of studying podiatry, I didn't do very well. I didn't show up that much. I focused on running when I could. And um, it was not a great year, but not a terrible year. Mm. The second year, I hated it. I hated everything. I got reasonably seriously injured and my running stuff fell apart and I was doing something I was no good at. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't really have any relationships with people that knew me Mm -hmm. there and I got to the point of being suicidal. Oh, that's so sad. And nobody knew. Mm. Nobody knew where I was or what I was dealing with and... Um, my family didn't have a clue, my friends didn't have a clue, because I'd just withdrawn from everyone. Mm, mm. Um, After after a failed attempt, um, I did go and start seeing a psychologist for a period of time, not a very long period of time. Um, I didn't really help me very much, and my dad decided that he would ship me off to Canada to live with my aunt for a a little while. My aunt being a doctor and he thought she'd be able to sort me out better than... Keep an eye on you. and Yep. mm. And while I was there, I started... I was able to get back into doing some of the athletics I wanted to do. I was surrounded by my cousins over there. My sisters were there for most of it and... Um, made the decision to come back and study something different. Mm -hmm. And that change in dynamics worked to kind of get me moving again. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if I hadn't been shipped off to Canada, it could have ended badly, but it got the next step going. Mm -hmm. Through university, I found engineering easy. Um, I I didn't have to work particularly hard at it. I was running reasonably well, not brilliantly, but reasonably well Mm. for most of the time. I had a small group of friends that I did my university projects with and I hung around with when I had to be there. Mm -hmm. And it was was okay. Um, I left university and the change of going to work I, I'm, and a lot of people struggle with change but I've always found change is actually very helpful for resetting my yeah. mindset um, I thrive on being challenged and being pushed and it's probably why I do what I do mm-hmm. um, it's when I get comfortable or when I am in a position that I really dislike that things start to go wrong and I've learnt over time that most of the times when things start to go wrong, it's because the relationships involved with it are breaking down and that's when I don't cope. I can cope with something being hard. I can cope with not enjoying something. But when I lose the connection to other human beings is when it all starts to go to nosedive. Um, I had an experience working on a major project here where the relationships with the people I was working with largely fell apart and I really disliked the time on the project Mm -hmm. and I found it very, very stressful. And that led me to a place where, again, I was suicidal. I was not in a great place. We had five young kids. The twins, who are my youngest, had just been born 
Um, we weren't coping at home. Oh, I had a work situation at work yeah. that I wasn't coping with and everything. This was not a challenge I knew how to deal with because my wife and I were ships passing in the night trying to deal with five, five kids, kids, the eldest of which was six, the youngest were oh. twins who were newborn. Oh, my goodness. Um, and our mums were both coming around a lot of the time to try and help and I, I completely lost connection with everybody. Oh, that was so tough. That was the so there there had been another brief attempt at getting help when our second son was born, and that had ended disastrously. Um, this was another one, and before I got to the point of trying to not be here anymore. I went and spoke to a GP that I've gone to for many years and I had a relationship that I could trust. Um, he put me on some medication. He didn't encourage me to go and see a psychologist. I have had two, ex two goes at seeing a psychologist and I was not open to doing that. Interesting that my son is studying psychology. <laughs> um, so he put me on medication and we put some methods in place to try and control it. The medication helped. It created a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. I was able to get off the project, which helped. I was able to take a little bit of time away from work. Um, and our kids grew, which helped because yeah. they got, yeah. they moved out of that phase. Um, but that was the point where, and that was sort of 32, 33 years of age, where I actually started to try and get help. At that point was also the point that I was made the CEO of the business. And that was another one of the things that changed that just helped my mind go, okay, I've got these th other things to think about and focus on and I can stop hearing what's going on in my own head. What's extraordinary about that? Well, many things, but during this difficult time, you were coming through it, but you were made CEO. That just shows how well you were able to keep, you know, the various triangles of different sides of your um, facade hidden from the work colleagues. Yeah. So mm. the work, the work colleagues could see the facade of work. Mm. I wasn't running because I couldn't. Just too busy. Just too. I just couldn't couldn't find this the yeah. this time and space to be able to do it and the family life was falling apart yeah, but the, as i said the the triangle the work people only saw that side yeah gosh and they had no idea the stress you were under otherwise in your life as i mentioned in the, in the introduction in what, in any one year at least a million extra australians experience depression and 2 million experience anxiety so on a podcast obviously there's a limit to what we can do but the one thing I think we really can do is help break down the stigma of talking about depression because there still is a stigma around it and I was wondering how you felt about that is that one of the reasons that you think you took some time to find help uh, I I took some time to find help because I didn't want to have something else wrong with me. Mm. Having something that is wrong with you um, makes it very, very real that you're yeah. not as perfect as you might like to be. I didn't want that to be the case. I didn't understand mental illness. I didn't know anyone that was open about suffering from a mental illness at yeah. that point in time. And all I saw was this is going to be something that stops me from doing everything so it, that I want to do. So the best thing to do is pretend it doesn't exist and move yeah. on. Yeah. I got to the point when the twins were very young that if I hadn't got help, my wife would be raising five kids alone. And the realisation that that was, that was actually reality and that was actually what might come about 
put me in a place where I, I either had to go, okay, well, she's raising five kids on her own, bye-bye, or I'm going to be here and I'm going to work out how to do this. Yeah. And um, up until – so that was 11, 12 years ago. The twins are 12 now, so so. 11 to 12 years ago was when all of this was happening. And um, it's not, it has not been smooth sailing since. It's not like it was a decision of mm. I'm going to get help and suddenly everything's rosy. Yeah. It has not been that at all. But it has been one where progressively I've become more comfortable with, okay, well, Depression doesn't actually have to define me. It doesn't have to make me anything that I'm not anyway. And so I live with having an anaphylactic reaction to seafood. I'm relatively comfortable telling mm. people about that. Yep. I live with having celiac disease. I'm relatively comfortable telling people about that too. Both of those are things that if I get wrong, I'm going to have pretty severe consequences mm. to them. Does mean that there's an interesting way I can kill myself, but mm, leave yeah. that one alone. We'll leave that one alone. Um, and I, I was challenged by the person who introduced the two of us and another colleague of mine who did know some of the story partially mm -hmm. because he was the first person I ever heard talk openly about it. Um, that getting to the place that I could talk about it too would actually help to break down the stigma for other people. Yep. And it it's an interesting one. I remember after one of the early talks that I gave, um, a lady came up to me afterwards and asked, does it help you to talk about it? And I had to stop because the scream inside my head was, no, it doesn't help me to talk about this. It makes everything real. And I now need to go away and be by myself for an hour. And what came out of my mouth was, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. A very diplomatic answer. <laughs> You do talk about it, and you mentioned earlier that you wrote a blog for the SA Mental Health Commissioners. So how did that come about, and why did you say yes? Um, I don't know how it came about, to be perfectly honest. I It came at a time, working in the engineering industry, there, there is one, one person who I had heard stand up as a senior person in the industry and talk about it. And he was the guy I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard anyone else talk about it. And I was in a position in the industry where I was able to be part of starting a conversation about mental health and kind of became the person. There was a year where I travelled to most states in the country talking about mental health, talking about my battle with depression. And I don't know how, but somewhere along the way, I got asked by the Mental Health right. Commission to write a blog. Um, I, I Writing is actually part of my therapy. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that I write, some of which I put on LinkedIn if I think they're something that might help someone else. Um, but there is an awful lot of stuff that I write that nobody ever reads yep. or sees, mm -hmm. and most of which no one will ever find because I delete them. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> um, mm. But I got asked to do that, and pretty much since the conversations with Sally and Robert, I have taken the view that if I'm asked to do something and I can do it, I'll say yes. Mm. Now, I've had to learn to put boundaries around that because sure. doing too much of it is bad for me. Yeah. Mm. But writing something was relatively easy because that can be part of my therapy and part of processing it and helping me 
to straighten the thoughts in my head out. Yeah, yeah, I can see how that could could work. But have you had um, much feedback from your talks and your blogs? And uh, I don't read them, to be you honest. Don't? Yeah. Um, I can tell you that um, I, I wrote an article on LinkedIn and one of my friends saw it and told me that it had a whole lot of likes and claps and yeah. whatever else people do on yeah. LinkedIn. I, I don't read the comments. Right. I The first one I wrote, I mm. read some of the comments and I couldn't do it anymore. So I don't actually read them. Yeah. But you are putting the information out there and I have to say being very vulnerable about it um, to help other people. That's your mission. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I'm sure it does help other people because, as you said, you were struggling with this without knowing that anyone else was having potentially similar struggles. Yeah. Have you identified any positive consequences as a result of being diagnosed with chronic depression? Uh, absolutely. So the... The thought, the, the, the things that I'm working on at the moment are about, and I, I'm actually writing my own book that I never intend for anyone in the world ever to read, but I'm writing it for me. And it's about how having had depression and having gone through that has taught me how to feel things mm -hmm. and made me a better person as a result of it. I I was someone, I was reasonably good at school, reasonably good at sport, didn't, didn't really have anything. There was nothing that, that from the outside people could look at and go, well, they're not doing, he's not doing that very well, is he? Mm. I wasn't great at making lots of friends. I hated large groups and those sorts of things, but I always had one or two close friends yep. that were okay, that that was enough, mm. and that was enough for me. But I could never have been in a position where I could have led an organisation or been the leader of a group of people without having had the experiences of having to learn about myself yep. and having to had to observe how other people do things. I think without depression, I would have probably ended up being – a very smart, quite arrogant and lonely human being because I never would have allowed myself right. to get close enough to anyone yep. to be anything else. Because and let there, down the guard. Yeah, because mm. there never would have been anything there. Yeah. And there's no way I could do my job today if I hadn't had the experiences of struggling with things and not being able to just do them. Mm. It's uh, and and I wouldn't have felt half the stuff that I have felt yeah. because I wouldn't have allowed myself yeah. to. I wouldn't have needed to. That's so insightful, and it's good to think about the positive impacts of even having a mental illness because, um, as you say, it can awaken you to the world in a way that otherwise you may not have been. Mm. And do you? How do you think your personal experience with depression has informed the way you lead, um, or the way you act as CEO at Tonkin Consulting? Uh, it it has certainly made me much more aware of what other people are going through and how other people are feeling. Um, I try to view the way that I lead as the the guy at the bottom of the organization who runs around making sure everyone else is able to be brilliant. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the model that I can like live. Like the support structure. The support structure underneath. Mm. That's the model that I can live with myself being in. And so I I spend a lot of time actually trying to make sure that everyone else in the organization is able to thrive mm -hmm. and to be good and to be able to do what they come to work to do. And that means that I have to be more in tune with what other people are feeling. Yeah. Now, I don't get it right all the time. I probably get it wrong more times than I get it right. 
but I'm trying. Yes. And I'm aware of it, which I don't think without having the lived experience yeah. I would have that I would have been able to. Yeah. Um, you, you're probably able, you may not even realise that you're doing it, but you're probably able to pick up signs and just analyse things in a, in a, in a way that's um, developed. And, yeah, I guess it makes you more, it gives you more empathy. Another question I had, which is digressing a little bit, but engineering's all, always traditionally been a very male-dominated industry and profession, and I just wondered in your observation, is that changing at all? There's a lot of things being done to try and change it, mm. but the numbers say it's not really changing. Right. I wonder why that is. Uh, there's. I, I, I heard someone once say that never underestimate the, the power a mother has over what their child studies post-school. Oh, interesting. Mm. Engineering has a history and a reputation for being boom and bust. I see, yeah. You, you get a job, you earn lots of money for four or five years and then you lose your job and you struggle to get another one for two or three years and then you go again. Mm. And it's true to some extent that, Engineering is a boom and bust cycle. Hopefully there are more people that can hold their jobs throughout the whole yeah. time. But it is a boom and bust one. It is a very male-dominated industry mm. in the first place. And it is a very analytical yeah. mindset. Um, and it's one where communication and talking and those sorts of things are generally not as prevalent as in other industries. Right. Um I think engineering has a lot to do in how it makes itself a more attractive career to mothers. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's a lot of careers like that. I came from a legal background and um, let me just say that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that field as well. <laughs> but lawyers, seem, they seem to be able to attract more females than engineering does. In the first instance, yes. But, but they drop out. They the, drop away. Yeah, it's yeah. It, it's a really hard industry to you know reach the kind of top levels in, um, and for the women that do it, they have made enormous sacrifices yeah. to to get there. I know a lot of lawyers who call themselves reformed lawyers, and actually most of them are females who call themselves yeah. reformed lawyers. Well, I'm one of them, and a lot of my women friends from law school are now doing various other things. So chronic depression is not something that you can just treat and it goes away at all. So it's it's a lifelong condition that you need to manage. And you've written about some lifestyle actions that you take to manage your depression. So can you share some of those with us? Sure. Um, I work on the basis that there, is, there are five things that I look at to try and work into what I do. The first is that I have a very structured sleep pattern to it. I don't always sleep very well. Um, part of so my clinical diagnosis is severe to extremely severe chronic depression and mild anxiety. It's more the anxiety than the depression that stops me from sleeping. Mm -hmm. But I try and go to bed at a very consistent time. And no matter when I get to sleep, I wake up at a consistent yeah. time. When the wake up doesn't happen, that's usually a pretty good sign that things are not going very right. well at all. Do you set an alarm for that wake up? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, once I get to sleep, I can sleep through anything. Mm -hmm. um, I've slept through typhoons in Hong Kong <laughs> and thought nothing of it. Was there a typhoon last night? <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, that was me. I've slept through earthquakes in Sydney. <laughs> I was there when the Newcastle earthquake was and we were on that side of Sydney and I was asleep. <laughs> don't know why I was asleep in the middle of the day, but I was. Mm. Didn't wake me. Um, so the second thing is around exercise. So I'm lucky. I love running. I've been very good at running. Um, and so just getting out and running and being by myself mm. is really helpful to just let myself go. Um, 
The next is diet. As, as I've shared, I have dietary issues left, right and center, but the biggest impact. So I don't drink alcohol by choice. I don't particularly like coffee, so I don't drink coffee, both of which turn out to be quite good choices for me. Um, but the big one for me is actually sugar. Right. I really strongly react to sugar okay. and it impacts my mood massively. Um, so I can get a massive sugar high followed by an incredibly okay. deep sugar low. Interesting. Do you does that apply to things like fruit? Or yes. is yeah, okay. Yes. Hmm. So I am incredibly it res- responsive to any of the O's in the the, f- yeah, the, the food, sugars. Cat- the sugars yeah. and mm. those sorts of things. And um, it doesn't really matter what it is. Mm. I'll plummet on the back end of it. Yeah. So I have to be very careful with how much and when I take them in. Um, so the diet makes a big part. And I, again, my go-to when I'm struggling and not feeling good is ice cream. Um, not great. I have lactose intolerance <laughs> and it's sugar which generally means, one, I'm in pain, and two, I feel like crap. So it's not really doing the job, is it? <laughs> no, but I, th- I think it is, and it's the go-to of what I want because yeah. I like the taste of it. Yeah, who doesn't? <laughs> um, so that's the, the next one. The final one is about stress. Um, or Sorry, the fourth one is about stress. Stress for me is one of these ones that I've had to come to the, the realisation that some stress is actually good. Mm-hmm. And as we talk through my story, there are times when having a change and having an increase in stress has actually helped me yeah. to get out of my own head. Um, I've come to accept that I need, need stress, I need to be challenged, I need to be pushed. And without that, it's as bad as having too much. Right. So there's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot. Mm. The stress that I don't deal well with is relational stress, and I don't deal well with boredom. Mm -hmm. So I can deal with most stresses, but relational stress is the one that kind of really pushes me outside. So it's more than an amount of stress. It's a type of stress issue. Mm -hmm. Um, But- Understanding that and coming to the the realisation that I'm only human and I can only do so many things and that means that I can only do so much. There's only so many things I can say yes to. Part of that is do I say yes to every time someone asks me to talk about depression? Well, three years ago the answer was yes. Today the answer is I'm really sorry but I can't do that much. Yeah, fair enough. Um, So I'm lucky to have you then. So thank you. (laughs) Um, The final one, and this is, so the first four are all ones that anyone would tell you they will help your physical or mental health. Mm, For general health. They're they're just generally things that you should look after. The final one and the one that kind of was the biggest eye opener for me was this concept of actually being connected to other people. Mm -hmm. Um, I... I'm an introvert. I openly admit that I'm really good at doing the one arm thing yeah. to keep people away from me. But the part that tells when I am really, really spiraling down is that I remove myself from everyone. And Even in- your wife? That includes Jen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She is the one who will pick it yeah. because she will go, you feel distant to me. And I'll generally turn around and go, huh, what are you talking about? And three days later, I'll realize that what she just said was the flashing red yeah. light of trouble on the horizon. Mm. But it can't just be Jen. Jen is my biggest support in my life and a wonderful person, but it's unfair on her if it has to all be her. Yeah, it's a lot to carry. Yeah. I I was lucky probably six years ago now, I got to go to do the high-performance leadership course by IMD in Singapore mm-hmm. where I met Sally. Yes. Um, 
and as part of that got introduced to this concept of secure base and what the secure base actually means for me. And I remember a conversation with people while I was there about, well, how many people or places or things do you need? And the answer was very vague and unhelpful for an engineer who wanted a number. (laughs) Um, And I still want a number. I still don't have one. But I came to the realisation that for me, really the only secure bases that I had were Jen and my faith. And that was it. And I needed more. You need more, right. And I, it's the thing I find the hardest and it's the thing that I will retreat away from the fastest. Mm-hmm. But I have a couple of friends that I let most of the way in most of the time. Mm-hmm. And again, they're pretty good indicators because I'll start declining lunch invitations or being busy and or just showing up and not answering any of the questions about me. Do they do they know you well enough to call that out, to say something to you? or uh, Some of them do mm-hmm. and some of them will feed it back to Jen. Right, okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was good that you've you've got that and you so you said you don't have a number, but what's your personal number? My target number is 6. I think I have 3. Okay, so you're halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> but it was 6 years ago and I thought I had 2. So I I'm, ah, I'm moving okay. very slow. Making, yeah. I've made some progress, but it's hard. You're doing it in a discerning way. <sighs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I'm doing it in a fearful way. Yeah, well, at least you, you're you open to it, though, and you, you know that that's something to work towards. I think it's time to wrap up this conversation because I could talk to you all day, but clearly <laughs> I think you, you've got other things to do. And um, So, Jerry, who inspires you? I, I, I knew you were going to ask me that question, and I don't have a great answer for you um i'm more inspired by nature and the beauty of and fragility of life and there's a i in susan david's book emotional agility there's a quote in there about life's beauty and fragility being linked and I forget who it's from, which is what, and I've got it completely wrong in the quote, but there's a, it's about yeah, that. Yeah. And to me, that's where the inspiration comes creation and being outside yeah. and, and that rather than things or people. Yeah. Just um, the, the beauty of nature. That's one of the things, one of the drivers for me for trail running. I just yeah. love it. Yeah. yeah, well, it's while while my running is done on the track, my coach and I have come to realise that a Sunday morning run in Belair National Park oh, is of critical stunning. importance to me. Yeah, oh yeah, it it I think it sets the tone for me anyway for a good week yeah. to have those long runs on the weekends. Uh, well, we we my coach and I have the argument over what is an acceptable distance. Um, I think we've settled that I'm allowed to do five or six K, but if she's listening, she'll probably tell you that she's never agreed to that. And it's more like three. (laughs) Yeah. I'm at the other end of the spectrum. I'm long and slow. (laughs) And so a question that I like to ask all of my guests is if you could recommend two things that people could do to improve or look after their well-being, what would they be? Firstly, Spend the time to observe yourself and observe others to see how you and they respond in various situations. Getting to know yourself more and how you respond to things will only help you in your journey. Mm. Mm. And I suppose the second one is don't try and jump to the end. As, a, as an engineer and a perfectionist, I want to jump to the end. I want to jump to the point that I have a cure for depression and I never have to deal with this ever again. Mm. But the best thing I can do is just to take the very small first step 
of something that I can actually manage and do. Yeah. Jerry, thank you so much for sharing your time and your story. Um, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you today. Thanks, Amanda. Wow, that was quite an episode. I feel enormously privileged, actually, that Jerry shared his story with me and with you. If you know someone who would be interested or could benefit from that episode, please do share it with them. Even in our crazy social media infused world, word of mouth still remains one of the best ways for people to find out about Vibrant Lives podcast. So please tell your friends about the podcast. And if you could take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts, that will also help people find Vibrant Lives podcast. And I'm always so grateful for that. So you can subscribe to Vibrant Live podcast on all good podcast providers like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast and Google Podcasts. And you can also subscribe on YouTube. And please do follow me on Instagram at vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast and on Facebook at Vibrant Lives Podcast. And if that's not enough, you can also visit my website at vibrantlivespodcast.com. On my website, you'll find a library of all my previous podcast episodes. You'll also find reviews of books, uh, health-related books, that is, that I recommend under the Amanda Recommends tab. Plus, you can find a contacts page where I would love to hear from you if there is something you'd like me to discuss or a person you'd like me to interview. And stay tuned for next week when I will publish a five-minute food fact episode about the humble egg. So that one's interesting because the egg has been maligned and now it's celebrated. So I'll give you a little bit of backstory about that, plus let you know the health benefits of eggs. This podcast is recorded on ancient Ghana land. I acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of this land and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. Thank you for tuning in. Eat well, move well. Think well, live well.